please time the general lady yields back, uh, Ms. McBath. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Secretary Mayorkas for joining us today. And I know that you've had a very busy week up here on the Hill. And I really appreciate your time with us today and for patiently incredible and also uh, credibly answering all of our questions. And it has been mentioned already, immigration is one of the most important issues that DHS, uh, that DHS uh, oversees. And immigration affects almost all sectors of American life, our family life, our economy and education. And it's imperative that we have a highly functioning, fair and efficient immigration system. And like many of my colleagues here today, my district, which is Georgia's sixth congressional district, is made up of a very large and vibrant Im immigrant community. And they are my neighbors and they're my friends and they're my coworkers. And as I've mentioned at a previous markup in our town of Johns Creek and also Shambly, about a third of the population there, they're made up of immigrants. And our district office caseworkers, they work tirelessly to help our immigrant populations get their visa applications processed and something that we've faced time and time again, like many other offices, there are very, very heavy backlogs. So I'd like to ask what, if anything, is being done to fix the backlog of employment authorization documents. And we know that there have been attempts to, um, you know, to, to really help alleviate these backlogs for certain non-immigrant visas, but we're still seeing very large numbers of constituents that are reaching out about DACA and TPS, e EADs, that are just taking so many months to be processed. Congresswoman, um, uh, three quick things. Number one, I must champion, as I have previously in this hearing and otherwise, of course, uh, the personnel of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services who are doing Herculean work um, uh, on, while uh, being under-resourced. Number two, uh, we are delivering processing efficiencies so that we can work through the backlog more expeditiously. And three, um, we are seeking uh, funding from Congress and we are also promulgating a fee rule as we seek to and continue to hire more personnel to be able to work through the backlog and administer immigration benefits in a timely manner, as is our goal. Well, thank you for that. And also, you know, as a graduate of an HBCU, Virginia State University, and as an American concerned about the threat of white supremacy, I want to now turn to how DHS is responding to the bomb threats against HBCUs earlier this year. Now, during our hearing um, a little bit earlier, it was called the rise in violence against minority institutions. We heard from experts on whether the government has done enough to combat violent right-wing extremism and white supremacy. And our witness, Dr. Jones said, and I quote, he says, I will say that there has been an uptick in my conversations with some of the joint terrorism task forces and the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security to pay more attention to this, end quote. So as arrests have still not been made in the investigations into bomb threats against many of our HBCUs, can you please describe for us what efforts the DHS is doing to prevent further threats or potential attacks on our historically black colleges and universities. Congresswoman, um, uh, thank you. Uh, I engage with the presidents of the HBCUs uh, to understand the impacts of the threats on their respective institutions and to better understand their needs to meet uh, the challenge of um, increasing uh, threats. We are disseminating information to the HBCUs and other institutions similarly situated both with respect to the threat landscape and what they uh, could confront, and also providing information to them about how they can best secure their institutions. We've also looked into the availability of the nonprofit security grant program and whether some of those funds could indeed be allocated to HBCUs and similarly situated uh, institutions, and indeed uh, some of the HBCUs as nonprofit organizations do qualify for the grant programs. And we are working to make sure that information about the grant programs is widespread and easily accessible, and the grant funding them itself is equally accessible as well. Those are some of the measures that we are taking. Well, thank you so very much for patiently uh, answering my questions. I know it's been very difficult today. 
uh, and you've been uh, a wealth of grace under fire. So thank you so much, and I yield back the balance of my time. General Lady yields back, Mr. Massey.